Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, short meeting and program tonight here at the Mason Area Historical Museum. I'm Doug Klein. I'm the president of the Mason Area Historical Society, and so I'll be presiding over this very short meeting. We're going to start our meetings like we normally do uh, with the Pledge of Allegiance, and tonight I think we'll sing a little bit of My Country Tis of Thee. So stand if you can uh, for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. My country is of me, sweet and of liberty, of me I sing. We're very glad to have our speaker here uh, this evening, and we'll get to him in just a moment. Uh, we tried to get Bill Nye the science guy, but we found out that here in Mason, we got somebody even better. Yeah. So, so uh, we're going to very much enjoy his presentation. He's presented for us before in the past, I think the last time on this topic in 2013. Uh, but he had also been speak about not just looking down, but looking up. So we might have him back again in a little while. Uh, let's go ahead and have our, uh, our secretary's report uh, for our minutes from the last meeting. Good evening. Uh, the July 16th uh, membership meeting of the Mason Area Historical Society was called to order at 7 p.m. by President Doug Klein. Pledge of Allegiance was said, and everyone sang the Star Spangled Banner. The finance report was given by Susan, and Doug announced the upcoming programs and forums. The program for the evening was on the electric urban railway that operated here a hundred years ago and was presented by Tom Nolte of the Lost Railway Museum in Grass Lake. This month's program was sponsored by King's Store. Tom Nolte is a facilities manager for the Lost Railway Museum in Grass Lake. He presented a video of the different ways to view the museum and the technology, technology they use. The Interurban Railway was a system of transportation that was commonplace then but now mostly forgotten. The Interurban Railway was a system of transportation that uh, chaos uh, in 18, oh, sorry, sorry, uh, in 1841, the Michigan Central Railroad passed through Grass Lake on its way to Jackson. In 1900, the city of Jackson streetcar line was taken over by a man named W. A. Wollen in partnership with another man, W. A. Foote, to form the Michigan United Railway. They built this interurban line from Jackson to Grass Lake with stops to transfer people to different communities. Lines were then built to Kalamazoo and North Lansing. The Lost Railway Museum has retained and restored two original cars and tells the history of that railway system. Thank you to Mr. Nolte for his presentation and, and invitation to visit the museum in Grass Lake. Thank you, Kevin. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes? Uh, hearing none, I just want to point out that we do have some information on that Lost Railway, Railway Museum out in the lobby. So if you want to try to find that after tonight's uh, presentation, please go ahead and do that. Uh, do we have Susan here tonight? 
No treasurer's report. No treasurer's report. Uh, we, we, we still have some money. <laughs> she, she won't tell me how much. <laughs> kind of afford me another week or so. Um, one thing I can tell you on the financial front is that, as we mentioned to you probably before, we are going to be beginning our campaign for restoring the pink school. Uh, back in 1976, uh, it cost uh, the uh, people in the city of Mason and the surrounding area $12,000 to move the pink school. And fix it up from where it was on the corner of College and Columbia to where it is now on uh, West Ash. Coincidentally, uh, here we are in 2021, and guess what it's going to cost to restore the pink school? Yeah, another 12 grand. So we've got to do a little bit of fundraising over the next few months. So uh, we have uh, we've been meeting about it, and we'll have more information to you shortly. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to roll things out. Uh, at our booth at Down Home Days on um, Saturday the 18th of September. Uh, so I uh, want to go through with you very quickly the upcoming general meetings, programs, events, and Saturday forums. We do have a, a sheet with that information in the back. If you would like to pick one up, most of it's still in your last newsletter, uh, which is also, I have a few copies of that back there too. Our next thing coming up is on Saturday, September 4th, at 1 p.m., this is the only thing that's at, not at the museum, it's at the Pink School. We're going to have a forum on learning to read with Dick and Jane. Mm -hmm. And it'll be at the Pink School Museum. Uh, we have discussion starters scheduled for 1.15 and 2 p.m. Uh, so if you want to come out on that Saturday uh, and uh, talk a little bit about Dick and Jane, I know I grew up with Dick and Jane, so <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll know what, uh, what I'm talking about. Um, Sunday, September 19th, that's right uh, after the Down Home Days Courthouse show, we're going to have, again, our antique appraisal fair. Uh, this is sponsored by Maple Street Mall and staff. It's $5 per item and three items maximum. We have a few of the posters in the back as well, so if you'd like to pick one of those up and post it, you're more than welcome to do so. And uh, so that's coming up on Sunday, September 19th. On Saturday, September 25th, uh, at 1 p.m., we're going to have a forum on the history of the Boy Scouts in Mason. So those of you who were former Boy Scouts, uh, you want to show up for that so that we can talk about it. We have our discussion starters at 1.15 and 2 p.m., as is normal for our forums. On Saturday, October 9th, though, that's our home show. That's the big home show. And we'll have $15 advance tickets available at Best Sellers, the Maple Street Mall, and the museum, and other places. And uh, uh, one of the places, of course, on the home tour this year is the museum. That's right, right here. Because this used to be somebody's home. And so we're more than, more than glad to tell you all the story about how this was the John Rayner house. Uh, then on Wednesday, October 27th, uh, Sandy Perry is going to talk about Undertaker stories. It's close to Halloween, so we've got, it's called Mason RIP. It's a, a little bit about funerary practices that we had in the past uh, in the area. And on Wednesday, November 19th at 7 p.m., at our next meeting, we have a presentation on building Mason's homes with Carolyn Cooper. A lot of people are very interested in the house, very interested in, in uh, how uh, the construction methods and so forth. As uh, my house shifted on its foundation last week, and now I can't close the bathroom door. Oh, uh, wow. I, I, this is near and dear to my heart, so I would pay close attention, close attention, and uh, uh, to that particular presentation. That's coming up on November 19th. Excuse me, yeah, it's November 10th. 10th, 10th, I'm sorry, it's November 10th. You don't want to get too close to Thanksgiving. Because the day after Thanksgiving on Friday, November 26th, we're going to have Santa Claus here again. So 4:30, uh, then he goes to the parade, then he comes back. Uh, so uh, get all the little ones uh, and uh, come on down uh, in the afternoon and in the evening to see Santa Claus. We'll have the place all decorated for Christmas too. So it'd be kind of cool to come to that. December, we don't know. Okay, we got a couple ideas. Uh, the people who do the Christmas play just uh, haven't been able to get it together because of the situation uh, of the pandemic. So we're looking at alternatives to just kind of celebrate in December. Past years we've had sing a lot and stuff. So we'll see. We'll see. So that's what we've got coming up until the end of the year. 
Uh, we also, of course, are looking uh, forward to uh, having a, a, a re-election of half of our board uh, coming up in October and November as well. If any of you are interested in volunteering, being docent, being on our board, anything like that, just see one of us. Our names are all in the back of every newsletter, so feel free to do that, and you can always call me. All right, is there any other business to come before the meeting tonight? Okay, hearing none, we'll go ahead and get started with our program this evening. Dr. Ralph Taggart is a professor emeritus from Michigan State University. Yay! <laughs> and uh, we have uh, an expert in pretty much uh, everything uh, geologic, physical, uh, uh, physical science, and everything else, uh, biology. I mean, you know, Ralph's done it all. He's also into astronomy and other things like that. So uh, a great person to talk to and a great person to talk with us this evening. Uh, we call him our neighbor because he's only two blocks away. So Ralph, come on up. Let's give him a round of applause. Slides here for you. Well, thank, thanks so much for opening up the sky for the sunshine and stopping. Yeah. Me. Yeah, well, I, I had to perform a special uh, ceremony that we won't get into <laughs> during the rain in order to stop it, but it seems to have worked. So. Uh, I hate to say this, but uh, your president misspoke when he started talking to us. He said we're going to have a short business meeting and presentation. It's not going to be a short presentation. <laughs> now, you are lucky. I am genetically programmed after 40 plus years at Michigan State for 50 minute or hour and 20 minute lectures. <laughs> I can guarantee we won't have an hour and 20 minute lecture, but anything else is, is, is for is the grab here. It could be for 47 minutes. Yeah, something. It'll be something. Now, let's see if I've got this all figured out. Oh yeah, the button. You said the button is all worn out. Is the one that run this slide for? Yeah, I was as a college professor. What can I say? Yeah, what, is, what are we going to do? Yeah. The Mason Esker. What is it? We're going to start out with what it is. Then we're going to pause for a moment and put it into context, and then come back with how it was formed and what it represents, because it isn't just a, a feature on our real estate. It is something a very important and one of the few obvious links that we have here in Mason to a fairly recent past, but in a past that really involves lost worlds, a completely amazingly different environment than what we would normally expect. The Mason Esther looked at from any one spot looks like a little hill. It varies between 40 and 60 feet above the terrain surrounding it. Uh, that hill, if you walked across it, would be very wide in most places. 150 to 450 feet is a common width for the esker. But if you get up there on top and then you start to look in different directions, you will see that it's not really just a little hill. It's a long, sinuous little hill. It is in the case of a Mason Esker, it is about uh, 22 miles long. And it starts all the way up into width, runs down to uh, parts of, of Lansing. Uh, one of the parks up there in Lansing is sitting right on top of the Esker. It runs through Howell, runs through Mason here, and really runs through Mason. The courthouse is sitting right on top of the Esker. Most of the downtown buildings are, and my house is. Uh, so it's a it's an obvious feature. Uh, in the old days, uh, when Michigan was still a swamp, which is the way God intended, and we've changed it all around by like rain and all the rest of it. But when Michigan was a swamp, the eskers in Michigan were a great way to travel because they were up above the swamps and not quite as dense in terms of vegetation. And the uh, the first people I like first people that have been Native Americans. I go with the Canadians on that. But the first peoples used them as, 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 as ways of moving from one place to another on the landscape to get the job done with as little trouble as possible. This is what the Mesa Esker looks like. Now, what's it made of? Well, that's pretty simple. Let me see if I can make this into work properly. Uh -huh. 
Here's a 19th now. The, the esker has been known since the very earliest settlers came, came in here into this area. Uh, throughout the Midwest, whenever you have one of these long, sinuous ridges that crosses the landscape, it just stands out because there's nothing like it. They tend to call them hogs' backs because they're a little bit irregular, like the, the back of an old fashioned hog, if you want to look at it, it that way. Uh, and this one was called at one time or another the Grand Hogs Back. If you wonder why we have a Hogs Back Road, it's because of the of the, of the esker. But here's a gives you a chance to look at the esker in cross section. Um, a lot of very big stones and big gravel at the bottom. Finer gravel as we work our way up, and it works us all the way up toward the top, where it tends to be mostly sand and a, a lot less gravel. Now you'll say, well. That's ugly looking stuff. No, that is Kingdom County gold. In other words, you can literally make your fortune if you can find nice deposits of gravel that can be mined. And then the reason it's nice to start with gravel, irrespective of what size it is, you can have machines that will then grind that gravel up into still smaller pieces. And every single road in, in the Ingham County area and probably 90% of the asphalt driveways probably have parts of the Mason Esker in because it is the, the major source of uh, what in the old days they would have called wool metal in this, in this particular area. But, all right, so it's a long, sinuous hill, maybe up to 450 feet wide, 60 feet tall at the most, 40 to 60 feet tall, meandering across the landscape in a north-south direction. Um, but it means a lot more than that. Let's start with a little bit of context before we get too deep into it. Oh, wrong way. Try it again. No, oh, come on. The one that you can't see. All right. There we go. No. Can we do this manually? Sure. You just tell me when to switch it. Yes. Okay, switch it. Well, we've got. Too much light in here. What this is is a map of Michigan. How, how are you going to know that? The, the, they did make the outline parts of Michigan of the map very, very uh, light. So I, I can see maybe why it didn't come through. You can just see paint on this. I was going to ask if there were any kids in the audience to identify this particular part of the map. But since the map isn't there, that's not a fair question. <laughs> um, it's Kingham County. Uh, now I know most kids are not taught to get along with maps anymore, which is a which is a terrible shame. You can drop people, have an airplane crash, and they have all the maps they need to get out to civilization, and they wouldn't make it because they, they, they where's their GPS? You can't plug a map in to the power to that. But this is in a county, and if we go one more slide, same faint slide here, but this is a zoom, this is in a county. This long street, the longest of the streets, is the Mason Esker. Right. Now you'll notice though, this is an Esker map. Look at there are a few Eskers up here, a few Eskers here. Most of them are concentrated down here in this corner of the state. And of all the counties in Michigan, Ingham County has more Eskers in it than any other county. So it's got some things that are that are remarkable. It's got a lot of Eskers, first of all, and it's got what is certainly the longest esker in the state of Michigan, probably the longest esker in the, in the country, and it's competitive for being one of the longest ones in the world. If you look up on uh, sites that talk about uh, geological features of different counties in Michigan, you'll see only one thing listed. We have no nothing of interest compared to most people, except for the Mason Esker. So it's a it's a it's a well-known geological feature, but Let's put esters into context and figure out where they came from and put them as part of a bigger picture. Next slide. Late 1700s, early 1800s in Europe, primarily. Few pioneering people doing this in, in the United States, but mostly it was European geologists. Began study, and the easiest place to study geology is in mountains, because mountains have lots and lots of rock exposures that don't have there are plants growing all over them, so they're easy to see. One of the things they noticed that were a very common feature in the Alps were so-called U-shaped valleys. Uh, this one doesn't happen to be in Europe. This one happens to be in Himalayas. But you can, they're, they're all over the place in, in the Alps. 
They're long valleys and they have a very, very definite U shape to them. The geologists began to wonder what caused that? How do you get a U shaped valley? Now, a V shaped valley is easy to understand. You've got two hills or two mountains that are by each other. You'll have a V shaped valley. But where do these, where do these U shaped valleys come from? A few other things about them. If the mountain that they're found in is high enough, there's usually a glacier up at the top of it. Uh, in the old days, a lot of these glaciers came a lot further down than they are today. We'll talk about that in a little while. Uh, there are rocks everywhere around these U-shaped valleys. On the edges, they tend, to, they tend to pile up on the edges, but there are also individual boulders and then piles of rocks. Uh, looks like a, a road grader ran, ran, ran wild there at the base of this valley, where there's just piles and piles of dirt and stone. And we'll come to that in just a moment. Very typical, but the valleys themselves, nice U-shaped. You can see them, if you take a trip out west, Many of the valleys in the Rocky Mountain system are nice and shaped valleys. Next, next slide. Uh, I mentioned that many of these U-shaped valleys have piles of dirt stones at, at the bottom. These are things that we call moraines. Moraines just look like hills, a network of a complex network of hills. This is a Michigan shot. The best example of moraines in Michigan is the Irish Hills. The Irish Hills are entirely uh, glacial moraines. They're e but they're easier to see if you get into places where the, the vegetation isn't quite so luxurious. You know, picture you know that a whole bunch of road builders just move the dirt around and then they just quit, walked away. That's what a moraine looks like. Now, you know, if you develop vegetation on the top of that, then what do you get of these network of hills? The little moraines are found up in the little mountain glaciers. These can be found in all kinds of places beyond the mountains, and they're usually quite large and so substantial. Next slide. Uh, striated surface rock, base, base rock, base country rock, as they used to say, it comes to the surface and exposed. Big, you know, that, that's the that's the, the rock fabric on which everything is built. These are cracks, so we don't pay any attention to those, but look at the fine lines. They all go in the same direction. They're all very, very close together. These are very common in the northern part of North America, the northern part of Europe. You see this kind of, of, of striations all the time. These are the kinds of things that you find in those U-shaped valleys. The exposed rocks in those U-shaped valleys often have these long striations. They're like the, the road machines that they bring out to cut the grooves in the pavement to make the rumble strips. Mm -hmm. As you come into a, an important intersection or something where they want to make sure you're wide awake, they'll groove the pavement by cutting it with, with these machines. Well, God didn't run around all over the Americas and all over Europe with cutting machines just to make loud noises with, with automobiles. But we'll see, this one is at a very exotic location, uh, an island called Manahatos. Uh, for those of you who are not from the East Coast, Manahatos is the island of Manhattan. <laughs> and it's in Central Park. You can see this, this kind of right in the middle of Central Park, this one part where the where the country rock comes up to the surface it's like it's been scoured by a, you know a, a gigantic cat or something like that uh but these things are very common in the u-shaped valley next slide erratic boulders one of our guests here had brought a picture of an erratic boulder that's in her backyard uh an erratic boulder is a big boulder sitting in the middle of nothing i'm sorry i don't mean Probably not, but sitting <laughs> out of context. And if you study the rock itself, it has nothing whatsoever to do with the geology of the surrounding area. It doesn't belong there, but it's a big rock sitting there. Now, you wouldn't notice it if it was just a little rock, but if it's a big rock, you can't help noticing that. <laughs> and you, got, you have to ask yourself, what, what's that all about? Now, remember, I told you that there were a lot of big rocks sitting around in the bottom of these U shaped. Valleys. Uh, this is a very special rock. Anybody recognize it? Plymouth Rock. 1620. Plymouth Rock. Plymouth Rock is an erratic boulder. It doesn't belong with the geology of the bay there where it was found. All right. So, what about these things? Okay. Now, erratic boulders, some of the early geologists found rather easy to explain. Sort of. 
Their explanation was, well, you know, when icebergs are formed up north, sometimes they have boulders in them. And the iceberg breaks off and it's got a boulder in it and it floats around until it melts and then it drops its boulder. Now, that is true. That's what happens. You can see if, if you've ever been down on a submersible, you can see all kinds of examples in the deep sea, you know, miles down of boulders that have been blocked right there on the seafloor, falling out of melting iceberg. But the trouble is, that's not going to do very well for Michigan, Minnesota, you know, all the all over the world, you've got these things in the again in the northern part of the continent. Uh, well, how do you think these guys with their love for icebergs and dropping rock, how do you think they explain? All of these erratic boulders that are not in the ocean but over land. Aliens. No, that's a, that's a 20th century explanation. <laughs> hmm? Oh, come on, we're going to get the glaciers in a minute. We're not there yet. Does anybody here go to church? The flood. The flood. The Noahic deluge. You know, and of course, that there's nothing in the Bible about you stop having glaciers or icebergs calving off, calving off glaciers. So they said, well, the ones that are found on land happen to fall out of melting glaciers during the flood, and that made them feel good. That, that you know they were not being they, they weren't coming too close to a, a boundary that they dare not cross in their writing and their thinking at the time. Uh, there was a whole school of geologists who didn't want to get too separated from their Bibles who were quite content that all of these erratic boulders came from melting, uh, melting icebergs and the ones on land came during the flood. Okay. Well, next slide, please. Not all geologists bought into that. The, the problem with the question of erratic boulders falling out of what uh, out of icebergs, of course, they do that. There's no question about that. But they don't explain all these other issues. They don't explain the grooves in the rocks, don't explain uh, the fact that we've got moraines, don't explain the fact that we've got esters. There are all kinds of things that they don't explain. It's an explanation that'll work for just one subset of all these strange things that they were finding up associated with the glacial valleys in. Uh, in, in the Alps. Well, this guy cracked the puzzle. His name is Louis Agassi. Uh, he was born in Switzerland. He went to very, very fine universities uh, for all of his education in Europe. Uh, took a visit one time to the United States and fell in love with the place. I mean, he, he fell in love with it not only geologically, but he, felt, he just he liked the place, he liked the ideas, he liked the idea that we had about liberty and so forth. He ended up on the faculty at Harvard University. He was a world renowned expert on fossil fishes. He was a very, very fine geologist. But in 1837, uh, he thought of a way that all of this stuff could be tied together. Most of the stuff that we were talking about, the erratic folders and all the rest of it, they're just enlarged versions of what we see looking at those alpine valleys, many of which either had or have glaciers at one end of them. You can explain those alpine valleys by explaining that they were formed by glaciers. I guess he said, well, what if it went far beyond the, the, the valleys associated with the Alps and other places? What if there was a large scale expression of glaciers that may have covered, you know, whole part of northern Europe, the whole part of northern North America, you know, all the way into Eurasia. What if there was a ice age, a period not too long ago, and that's, that wasn't a hard thing to figure out because all of these features that we're talking about are surface features. To get older stuff in geology, generally you have to go down deeper into the rock record. This is all stuff at the surface. So we say that what if not that long ago, there were great ice sheets that were moving around on the surface of the land, carving those striations because in those valleys, when the glacier moves down the valley, uh, the glacier has at its base all kinds of rock materials that have been captured. Yeah. Scrape these grooves, makes the grooves. Carrying rocks, these rocks behind. 
pushes the dirt as the glacier moves back and forth in response to climate, pushing dirt around makes the moraine. Well, the people who like the rocks dropping out of the glaciers weren't too happy with Agassi and his theory. Uh, went through a long period of bouncing back and forth. Sometimes his theory was in favor, sometimes it was out of favor. But in the end, it was the, it was the theory that finally made it true. And in fact, by the time he got toward the end of his career, next slide, uh, here's the initial way that it was visualized. Of course, now there's ice all over Greenland and extreme northern Canada and extreme Arctic up here. But he's talking about ice that extended all the way down into uh, the Midwest here, all the way down over the, nor the northern parts of Europe and, and parts of Eurasia. Uh, that was originally what he was talking about when he talked about an ice age, that this had been a period where this happened. Well, next slide. By the time he was done with his career, I'm glad at least this is partly visible, um, they had discovered by careful analysis of all of these, how sometimes these things were layered on top of one another, there have been more than one. There, in fact, in the last half a million years, have been five major periods where, if we back up that slide just again, back up, yeah, where it would have looked like this. Half of all the northern areas of the, the, of the continent largely covered by ice. How much ice? Well, ice about right here in Mason, Michigan, it would have been over a mile thick. We're talking about a lot of ice, not a heavy stuff. Um, next slide again, get back to this one. That happened five times. Now, uh, I won't go into how you figure these are global temperatures going all the way back half a million years. They're very precisely done. You can do that chemically. We won't go into how that happens, but it's, it's easily done. Here's the latest one. This is the one that you see if you go up into the mountains of the Alps today or into the Rockies or any place else. These are the ones that left the, the gouges on the rock in Central Park. Uh, notice the, this is temperature scale. It gets warmer toward the top, colder as you go down. Uh, here's the cold period. It peaked about 20,000 years ago. Now, 20,000 years is a long time if you're talking about history, but that's human history. 20,000 years is a hiccup on the geological uh, picture of history. It was next door for all intents and purposes in terms of time. About 20,000 years ago was the peak of the glacial uh, coverage, which would have corresponded with that map that I just showed you. And since then, it has been warming up. Each time this happened, it got cold, then it got warm, then it got cold, then it got warm. Each of these cold peaks corresponds to a glacial interval where this great ice sheets came out of the mountains, certainly came out of the mountain of the Alps, certainly came out of the Rockies, but came down from the north here in Michigan, all the way up the source areas for most of the glaciers that would have affected the Midwest here or up in central Canada, all right? Those glaciers came all the way down from central Canada uh, into the midsection of the country. Each time that happened, now the precise layout of the ice wasn't identical each time, but it was very similar. Uh, but something I want to point out the cold areas are what we call the glacial period. The warm areas, the, the, the warmer areas between each of these cold periods, came up with a very fascinating name for them interglacials. In other words, <laughs> these are the times between the glaciers. And you'll notice, uh, it gets warm, gets warm, gets warm, gets warm, gets warm. Uh, at the time this, this was made out, uh, made up, uh, this was the warmest of the interglacials right here. Uh, not quite as a little bit warmer than this one, but they all got respectively warm between glacial periods. Where are we? Well, we are in this interglacial right now. In other words, right now, the environment that we have, uh, that's between glacial episodes. I want to talk something real quick about the shape of these curves because we're going to bring this up again. Let's take this last one as, as, as one example. Notice that it takes a while for things to get cold. In other words, this is a time scale 500,000, 400, 300, 100,000 years. This is a time scale. It takes almost 100,000 years. We go from the peak of the last interglacial, the previous interglacial, to our last glacial period. 
But notice how quickly the earth warms up. You got to force the earth to get colder. And we now know what, what causes that is very, it's the interaction of very little tiny things about the way the earth orbits the sun and the way it intercepts energy from the sun, coupled with the state of atmospheric carbon dioxide at the time. If we go through a period back here where there were a lot of uh, volcanoes going off, chances are there were a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it would be warmer. But on the other hand, just like there are periods where a lot of volcanoes are going up, there are periods where it's not meant for a while. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere goes down, that helps it get colder. So I want you to remember this asymmetric nature. It's on all of them. It takes a long time to get cold, it's warm real fast. Long time to get cold, it's warm. Long time, warm, all the way up until today. So we're gonna, that's an important pattern, and we're gonna come back to it before we're done. Next slide. Okay, you've got a glacier. By the way, if you ever get a chance to walk on a glacier, don't do it. <laughs> Glaciers are one of the most hazardous things that you will ever encounter as a field geologist. Uh, they're usually extremely uneven on their surface because the ice is always cracking because the, the glacier is dynamic. It's a dynamic thing. Glaciers are always, they're always melting, always. And they're being some most of the time they're being replenished from the source area, that area up in central Canada, for example, for the Midwest here. So a glacier is dynamic. How far it extends away from its source area depends on uh, what what's happening in terms of snowfall and ice accumulation in the source <laughs> area, as, as opposed to how fast it's melting down at the terminus where the glacier ends. Uh, the ice doesn't do well with that kind of that kind of environment. So, you, well, you wouldn't even think of walking on this stuff if you could do it. If you think you could do it, don't do it. <laughs> because that's what it's like underneath. And there, you know, we've lost more good geologists, but mostly geology students. <laughs> like graduate students are a dime a dozen, you know, so you know, it's a few uh, But it tells you, you put a sign up in that part of the glacier that they don't, let's not work here for a while. <laughs> Uh, but some of the crazy things fall into the glacier. We'll talk about that in a second. But you've got this big expanse. You know, here, this is a uh, valley glacier on Alaska. Here's the source area back in here. Uh, we're right here at a, the effect of basically it's a cliff where it has reached the ocean and it's dropping off lots and lots of pieces of ice, small icebergs. That's the found this picture was taken. Next slide. Other things come out of glaciers. I mentioned the weird things go into glaciers. Sometimes weird things come out of glaciers. This is Atsi called the Ice Man. Uh, he ended up coming out of a glacier in the Alps, right between Italy and Austria. In fact, they've argued ever since on which side of the line Atsi really was. Uh, he just thawed out of the ice. Well, when they found the first uh, hikers found the body. They thought it was a homicide. After all, Italy is very close by, you know. Maybe this is some sort of a mafia hit. Well, all right, so the forensic people came out and they got the body dug out of the rest of the ice and they took it back. And boy, something just didn't look right. Uh, they had a whole bunch of fur clothing that came along and there was a bow and a couple of, of, of knives and a very, very weird copper axe. We talk about it. But they said, well, yeah, let's, Let's do a radiocarbon date on this corpse and find out, find out when he died. Well, he died about 5,500 years ago. All right. He was, by the way, he was not a nice guy. The story is still being pieced together how he happened to die up there and uh, have his body fought in the glacier. But let's just say he wasn't one of the good guys. And uh, very, he, he had an arrow wound in his back, which was probably the thing that killed him. And, and, Based on the stuff he was carrying and some other things, he probably deserved to have that. Out of his back. <laughs> but the point is that glaciers carry all kinds of things that they ebb and flow. And sometimes when they're pulling back, as, as glaciers are doing now, they leave some things behind. Some of them very, very strange indeed. Next slide. Here's a map. This is Lake Michigan. Right. Obviously, Huron is over here. Superior is up here. But these are moraines associated with Michigan. They're all over the place. See, they're all like lobes. Here's a lobe, 
Here's a lobe. Here's a lobe down here. Here's a lobe here. The glaciers are coming from different directions. Even at the same time, they're coming from different directions. And each of them, as it, you know, when they're moving forward, they tend to, to flatten everything out. That's why, by the way, our, our skyline is so regular and boring. Uh, it's just flat here in Michigan most of the time, except for the moraines, because the, this acts like a gigantic snow plow. Well, you see what the what the what Mike Sparking about looks like at the end of the winter, right? Yeah. <laughs> These great piles of snow and here, there, and everywhere that the that the that the bulldozers have pushed off to one side. Well, the glaciers do that with dirt, and they now once they when they start to retreat, then they may stop someplace else and move back and forth a few times, pile up some more dirt. They live these incredibly ancient or intricate uh, sets of moraines. That's the kind of thing that makes the, the Irish hills once all the ice is gone. Next slide. Okay, uh, I'm going to drop down into Ohio. I had an opportunity as a graduate student, a master student, kind of do some interesting field work. Here is the glacial map of Ohio. This is the map of the last glaciation. This is a map of one of the earlier glaciations. Uh, the most latest stuff is has covered up the earlier stuff. The glacier all the time is shedding water. It's melting, as I said, all the time that it exists. Not as much when it's moving forward, but it's still melting when it's in contact with the ground. And that water drains out from under the glacial ice sheet. If you can imagine, here was the ice sheet at, at its greatest extent uh, into what they call uh, uh, basically, uh, what do I want to call it? <laughs> in the moment. It, it, it's outwash, yeah, glacial outwash. It's gravel and sand and gunk that comes with the water as it comes out of the glacier. But the glacier is scraping water and dirt up the whole time it's moving. And the water is flushing out as it melts under the glacier and carrying this stuff out beyond the glaciers. But what is not so obvious, now here's one outwash area here. These, these are streams that were coming out of the glacier and carrying a lot, an observable amount of geological trash with them, so much so that it, it's no problem at all to recognize them what's happening. Uh, believe it or not, these are related to the esters, but they're not the same because these things are not elevated. Streams, there's a, there's a up in the park and lands, and there's a sign which has got some grievous errors in it. It implies that esters can build up because of debris washed out from under the glacier that, that piles up with time. Well, the water does not go uphill. You do not build up a, a 40 meter wave, you know, uh, squiggle on the map, 40 feet high, 60 feet high because of water. Right? But it's the same gravel that we're talking about, the same sediments that we're talking about. So what we get, next slide, is what's going on underneath the glaciers. The water has to get out. Water flows downhill. Water can melt ice. All right? This water flowing underneath the glacier basically thaws out tunnels. Now, this is a modern one up in Iceland. Uh, present day glacial outwash. And this is the stuff that once it gets past the glacier, we would call an outwash. It's gravel. You notice there's gravel here, stones of all sizes, some big boulders, you know, embedded in the side of this channel. Um, the ones that came under the glaciers that were here in Michigan, the mild thick glaciers, they were sometimes as high as 40 to 60 feet. These tunnels, They're, they could be railway. Tunnels are so big. But they're, at the beginning, there's a rushing stream of water that's coming through that's carrying debris. Now, what kind of, if this is a very fast flow of water, what kind of debris is it going to be carrying? It's going to deposit silt and sand, or what is it going to deposit? Gravel. Gravel, or even the rocks. Okay. But certainly coarse stuff. Now, as it carries that down, gradually over time, this tunnel starts to fill up a little bit. And it's like having stopped up plumbing. It's like having hard, hard water deposits on your plumbing. The water can't move through as fast. 
I know that in my own kitchen, I should have somebody come in, grind out the pipes a little bit, but I wouldn't do it right now. But this spigot slows down. If it slows down, what kind of material is going to be the product? Lighter weight. Well, yeah, smaller, you know, if, if it was big top piece of the rock and had bigger pieces of gravel, it was smaller gravel. And as this thing fills up, finer and finer sediments because the stream is forced to slow down. And as it slows down, as it slows down, it's not as effective as transporting material and has to drop out the heavier stuff. It can get all the way filled up, completely stopped up. Now that's not the end. It's not like your plumbing being all stopped up. Uh, it'll break out someplace else. It's got to go someplace. The water has to go someplace. But any given in, in the big glaciers, any given tunnel is likely to fill almost to capacity before we have a chance to melt the glaciers. Now, when we do melt the glaciers, what do you think we have? We got a meandering, like the tunnel was meandering, pile of what we call their greatest sediments. They start with poor stuff at the bottom and go to lighter and lighter, smaller and smaller stuff toward the top. Their eskers. So the esker forms from a tunnel under the ice, carved by the water that's draining out from under the glacier. And it's a lot of work. You can't imagine. Imagine Michigan covered with a one mile thick block of ice. Uh, that's a lot of water. And as that, especially as that starts to melt, it's carrying a tremendous amount of water. And that fills up these tunnels, and you're left with these meandering piles of miscellaneous sediments. And then, of course, they get covered with dirt and eventually start growing trees and grass and all the rest of it. And we have the Mason Esker and all the all the Esker's quite like it. So Eskers, once you've got your head into the whole business of these great, large, what we call continental ice sheets, that are really big, Eskers are easy to explain. The, uh, of course, the uh, deposit at the edge of the, of the glacier, that's easy to explain. The occasional piece of rock that's dropped out, or the corpse, or anything else that comes out of the glacier, <laughs> that's easy to explain too. The scale is just larger than it was up in the mountains, but it's the same principle. Next slide. What the top of the tunnel leads to is the esker with its you know, stratified sediment. Stratified means they're different at different levels and it starts to get coarse and it gets finer and finer as you move towards the top. All the eskers in Michigan were formed that way, all the eskers in Minnesota, all the eskers. Illinois, all the eskers in Indiana, all the eskers in Ohio, all the ones in Europe, all form exactly the same way. Next slide. There's another thing though that the glaciers do. They leave behind big pieces of ice that, that break off. Because the, ice, the, the glaciers, particularly when it's melting, doesn't have a lot of structural strength. And so it's easy for big pieces of ice to break off. Now, if it was sitting at the edge of the ocean, those big pieces would fall off into the ocean. And make an iceberg. <coughs> These lakes are formed by in place icebergs. These are formed by big blocks of ice. That, and I mean big blocks, bigger than your barn. Big blocks of ice that get left behind, embedded in the dirt as the, as the glaciers pull away. Well, it might have helped. Of course, you've got all blocks of ice. Surprise, surprise, this was a picture taken in Minnesota. Where do we have all of our lakes here in Michigan? Anywhere. Why? Because we do have lakes in Michigan. We have civilian lakes in Michigan. And, you know, and we have them everywhere because the ice was everywhere. In Ohio, if I were to show you that map again of Ohio, don't look for any lakes unless you want to fish in a, a dammed up stream someplace. Don't look for any lakes unless you go north of that line. Where the glacier was, there are ponds and lakes. Where the glacier wasn't, nothing to speak of. You got streams, occasionally you'll get a natural lake, but not often. Now, of course, the lake business goes all the way up to some very, very big lakes. We're familiar with those too, which by the way, changed their form as the, as the glaciers moved away. There were times when all the major Great Lakes, Superior, uh, Michigan and Huron were all part of one gigantic lake. 
Lake Algonquin, they called it. There were times when they were separated in different ways because the ice blocked off things and filled up the basins in different ways. The, the Great Lakes have looked like different things at different points in the last 20,000 years. But they've been here ever since the ice pulled away. They're the greatest repository of fresh water on the face of the planet. But kettle lakes are these small ones that are created by these big blocks of ice that were left behind. Next slide. Okay, the ice retreats. There's a lot of bare dirt that gets uncovered as the ice retreats. Most of the thoroughs uh, are ground down. But vegetation changes on that surface. Let's go to the next slide. This is one of the first projects of a sort. This is not this very one. This was from a bog in Chatsworth, in uh, Chatsworth Bog in Illinois. But if you core down into the sediments at the bottom of the lake, you can, if you're good at it, you can pour all the way down to the, the original surface before the lake filled with water. But you can get a core that runs all the way through the muddy or sandy or whatever kind of sediments it might be. You can take samples along those sediments. You can date them with radiocarbon dating. Here's the Chatsworth bog sequence uh, begins 14,000 years ago. That pond, that lake where we, this, this was taken, began 14,000 years ago because the glacier had pulled back and there was a basin full of water. And things started to grow on the, around the, this lake. What were the first things to start to grow? Well, we look at the blue thing, we look here at the lake, spruce trees. Just pop forward this one and then we're gonna have to go back. This is what Chatsworth, Illinois, Central Illinois looked like 14,000 years ago. That's what every place in Michigan looked like within 100 or 200 years after the glacier had pulled back from it and you get a piece of real estate. But does it stay that way? Uh, yeah, it's ideal. This, this kind of vegetation is ideal because it's wet and it's cold. Uh, spruce trees, fir trees, some kinds of pine. Typical northern, northern Michigan stuff. Southern Canada stuff today. Um, pop back again. Okay. Not just spruce, but after spruce come in, you see, first really important broadleaf trees that come in are ashes. Elm trees follow. Looking at the percentage of pollen in the sediments, you can tell what's <coughs> growing around this lake in, uh, in Illinois. So it starts off with the spruces, then it changes mostly to an elm dominated forest. There's still a few spruces there. Eventually the spruces disappear, but by then elms have come in. There's still some uh, ash trees. Eventually oaks come in. We've got grasses. We've got other kinds of weedy type plants. By the way, you can see when the first Native Americans first start cultivating uh, corn, because corn pollen can be found in these profiles. It's usually around a thousand years ago uh, that in this part of the world, Native Americans started cultivating corn. Uh, when you get to the very top of these, now this only, you know, you can, don't get anything super recent here. This stops at about a thousand years. But if you've got a super recent record, there'll be a ton of corn there in a place like Illinois because they're growing corn on a commercial scale today. You can see all of this happening. You can follow the changes in vegetation. When, and all this changes from a spruce forest to basically an oak forest. Other, other kinds of things can be found as well, and that is principally the animals that we might look at. You know, slide the next one. Let's go to the next one. Okay. Big animals. Big animals, most importantly for this discussion, big animals that we don't find anymore. Mammoths. They're like woolly elephants, but they're much bigger than modern day elephants. Uh, mastodons. They're smaller. They're like not, they're not dwarf elephants, but they're small elephants, hairy as well. Horses. Now, if you're a historian, you say, well, there are no horses in North America. The Spanish bought the first horses in the 1400s, late 1400s, early 1500s. Well, they did bring horses, but they weren't the first horses. The horse evolved here in North America. And it went across the Bering Horses, went across the Bering Land Bridge into Eurasia. Uh, why did they stay in North America? Well, we're going to see in a moment. The last horses that were native to North America got eaten, not ridden. 
In other words, they were game animals, just like the rest of these are potential game animals. Giant sloths, huge beavers, you know, giant beavers, uh, lions, there's an American lion, uh, saber tooth cats, uh, camel like camel like animals, all kinds of them. There's a puzzle about them though. Uh, where do they where do they get to? Next slide. We have in North America a problem. It's a large mammal problem. 35 different kinds of these large game animals. Now we're not talking squirrels here. We're not talking muskrats. Big, huge, galumping game animals. They disappear starting with the can we see one more slide might do it. Yeah. This is a time. Now, this is unusual because this is so recent that we're at a time when the first peoples come over, the first nations, they're people that come from Eurasia, come across the Bering Land Bridge. There are some glacier free areas down here under which they can move, and they swept into the North American continent. And in less than 4,000 years, they were down to the South America. These were the first peoples, the first human beings come no earlier versions of human beings that's back in europe these were full-blown modern-day human beings that came over not that long ago now the dates are still disputed but it's probably somewhere between 15 and 25,000 years ago uh, most of the evidence points to something close to 15. they flooded into the continent now let's see if we can back up two slides this is that first animal slide this one Paul Martin, who died just a few years ago, I tend to know people who die a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't understand why that is. Yeah. He put the Pleistocene is the, is the official name for geological name for this period of time in the ice ages that we're talking about. Uh, he talked about uh, had a hypothesis that it was overkill. These people came into the Americas from the across the Bering Land Bridge. They were accomplished hunters. Let's look over. I think I've got an example of an uh, arrow, not a spear point. So, next slide. Next slide. Uh, some of the more famous of the hunters are the Clovis cultures. They made beautiful points, projectile points, spear points, everything. They're, they're, they're just absolutely gorgeous. These guys were very, very good hunters. The other groups of early Indians who came across, next slide. We tend to call them paleo Indians because they're not anything connected directly to any modern tribe of, of First Nations here on this continent. They certainly are the ancestors of the people on this continent, or more, maybe not, because people kept coming across the, the, the land bridge. It's important to realize that every single human being living on this continent today is related to immigrants. And I don't care whether they're people who have been here for 15,000 years or whether they've been here for 15 years. We're all immigrant. We all come from immigrant families. There was immigration back in those days, too. The original Paleo Indians got but displaced by other first people. And again and again and again. And they were still shuffling our land when, when we first ran into them. And we showed them what it was really like to have your land taken away. Okay? <laughs> um, but they were all very good hunters and paul martin says you know these animals in north america these big animals they didn't they never evolved with people they were never exposed to people this didn't happen in africa or asia or europe because human evolution took place along with the evolution of the animals they learned to tolerate us they had they learned to, to handle us as predators and, and and still be successful the native North American animals were naive. And over out of, out of nowhere come these people who are excellent hunters. And they're, you know, mammoths are probably just standing there saying, What are you looking at? What are you doing here? And you know, easy, easy to kill. They killed and ate anything that was easy to kill. And that includes the first horses, the giant beavers, and all the whole, whole rest of the menagerie. Now, which ones couldn't they kill so easily? Well, who is left? Who's the large? What are the mammals that are large mammals that are left? Bison, bear. Bison bears, moose, elk. caribou, elk. Who knows the list? 
but it's way short. It's short 35 different kinds of big mammals that should still be here in art. The ones that were able to adapt very quickly to these new hunters, they made it through. The ones that couldn't, didn't make it through. So we're not the first ones to drive large scale extinctions. Uh, it's just that we're a lot more effective at it than, uh, than some of the earlier people were. Next slide. Uh, there's, this is a percentage in these sediments like from the bog that I'm talking about. It's a, it's a fungal spore. And it's a fungal spore that is associated with the droppings of large plant eating mammals. So you can use the, the ups and downs of these fungal spores to tell how many large grazing animals were around. You'll notice there are ups and downs here, but there's a, a steady downward trend from about 14, 15,000, 15,000 years ago, let's call it. Uh, pre clovis people certainly were arriving by 15,000 years. By 14,000 years, we see the geolog uh, geological evidence for more widespread fires. People used fires. It was no longer just a matter of, of natural fires. And they often probably used fires to clear forests either for plants. They weren't into agriculture yet, but by burning out parts of the forest, they were used up easier to hunt. Okay. Um, but it wasn't, you know, by 12,000 years ago, all of these big guys that we were talking about, big animals are gone. Here in Michigan and, and, and every place else. Uh, next slide. All right, we're talking everything that happens here leading into this last interglacial period. There's a natural question that you can ask. Uh, okay, we've been back and forth, back and forth through five ice stages, maybe a few more and the earlier ones. What happens next? Well, actually, it'd be a pretty easy question to answer if it weren't for us. Uh, next slide. Okay, here's the last interglacial. Here's the present interglacial. Here's the last glacial. The others are over here. So let's pay attention to it. Now, something I want us first to look at this. This is the mean global temperature in the Uri's Fahrenheit. In other words, the average temperature of planet Earth. The whole thing, the whole planet. They've got it pegged down here on the date this paper was published at 60 degrees. I am, I'm going to say, only 80 years old. And every day that feels a little longer than it used to. But when I was first studying, Temperatures. I, I thought I was going to end up being an ecologist. So I needed to understand temperatures and habitats and that sort of thing. The average temperature of the planet Earth was 57.5 degrees. It's now 60 degrees. It, it's gotten warmer. Okay. Uh, if there was no problem, what do these things always do? Well, it, we would then be in for a gradual return because nothing else has changed about the orbital factors that interact. And if we weren't messing around with carbon dioxide, we would slide into another ice age. Now you wouldn't have to worry about it. It's gonna take them, you know, it's gonna take a hundred thousand years to get there. But at least you know what's coming. And it's not particularly daunting. I mean, yeah, we'll lose a lot of prime real estate for a while. I mean, <laughs> there's going to be no Lake Michigan lake frontage when it's all under a mile of ice. But you could relax and say, well, it'll come back. Right? The, the glaciers always do melt in the end. So somebody put me in suspended animation, and I'll take care of the cottage once I get out. That's <laughs> <laughs> a long haul, but it would be colder again. It is not going to do that. Now, why is it not going to do that? Because it's as if we entered one of those periods in Earth history where there was a lot, a lot of volcanic activity and a lot of extra carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. We're going to make the Earth warmer. Now, if you, if you live here in Michigan and you're sick and tired of slipping and falling and having to clean the ice off your car, you're going, well, that's not bad. Well, it's going to get warmer, and it's got to get warm enough that the human race has never existed in an environment that's that warm. Next slide. 
Uh, now, there are other people, the same people who told you there was no COVID 19, mm -hmm. there was no worse than flu. They have all the They're just, it's getting a little warmer sometimes, but it, it, it's fluctuating all over the place. No, it does uh, in Mauna um, Loa Observatory on, on the on flanks of Mauna Loa in Hawaii, out in the middle of the Pacific, because the air that, that flows over that island is thoroughly mixed air by that time. They want to keep track of global carbon dioxide. They started back in 1958 taking precision carbon dioxide measurements all year long. Here is the Mauna Loa curve for the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Now, for the last since Oh, go all, you can go back to the Roman Empire. There are lots of ways we can measure atmospheric carbon dioxide into the remote past. If you go back to the Roman Empire, it would be about 280 uh, parts per million carbon dioxide. When I was first studying ecology, it was about 290 parts per million carbon dioxide. In the late 1700s and early 1800s, as the Industrial Revolution was really getting going, we start burning a lot of fossil fuels, and the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere starts to go up. They started this in 1958, it was about not, well, about 315 parts per million. It's been going up steadily ever since. They just hit a record. They're not happy with this record. The record this last year was 420 parts per million. It's on its way to double it. Now, you might ask the question, what's this? I saw. I said precision measurements. It depends, the precise measurement depends on what season of the year it is. In the summertime, carbon dioxide levels go down a tiny little bit. Why? Because there's more land in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. So during the northern hemisphere summer, there's a lot of vegetation that sucks carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. During northern hemisphere winter, which is southern hemisphere summer, there's not enough vegetation down there in the southern continents and nothing everything turns off in the northern hemisphere and so the carbon dioxide level goes up a little bit and this happened you know that's regular as clockwork right you can set your watch by it but this is the, you know there are no setbacks here there's no turnarounds there's no stabilization it's going up and it's continuous to go up now there's a relationship between atmospheric carbon dioxide and temperature. We can have a mix graph. Uh, it's much messier to measure global temperature. Carbon dioxide is easy, it's a simple chemical experiment. But, um, but here's the trend for, for temperatures. Uh, you can see early 1900s, 1880, down here in January, but it's been on its way up since the 1920s. Now, here there is some variability. Sometimes it goes higher, sometimes it goes lower, but the overall trend is constantly going up. And it shows no great reversal up here. No more, no miracles that are going to show up on a Sunday morning and change everything. Next slide. This is sea level. Where's all what's happening as the world gets warmer? Well, as the world gets warmer, any exposed ice has a tendency to get melted. The two great reservoirs of ice on planet Earth are Greenland, which is a big load of ice, but Antarctica, which is a kind of gargantuan load of ice. They're melting faster because it's getting warmer. As they melt faster, all right, sea level rises. Now, just to give you, you're in the middle of one of these glacial periods that we've been talking about, where so much ice is all tied, all so much water is tied up in ice. Sea level was 270 feet lower than it is now. 270 feet. If you melt all the Greenland ice and all, or even a big portion of it, and the Antarctic ice, then you're going to have troubles on your hands, really big troubles. Like where are most of our big cities located? On the coast. On the coast, because it's convenient for shipping. Right? Every major city in the world that's on the coastline is susceptible to um, this sea level rise. And by the way, that's picking up in terms of speed. When I was first a young fellow working on this kind of stuff, it was a consistent 1.54 millimeters per year. Sea level came up that much. Uh, now it's almost double. You, it's hard to see, but this curve is flatter than this curve is. And by the way, why does this curve suddenly get dark? 
Well, now we have two ways. You know, these are all these measurements were done with worldwide gauging stations to look at the sea level. But right here, right about in the early '70s, we started to be able to measure that independently from satellites with precision rate and radio. So we, we could, these are both graphs right here. You notice they, they tell the same story. We haven't had methodology that's lacked out there. I think that's national the last one. The problem is, is problem number one is convincing most a lot of people that there, that there is a problem. This is a, a graphic that shows the Earth from 4.6 billion years ago, where it first solidified as a planet, through all the million oh, billions of years before there was any living things on it, and then the development of living things, we get about about 400 million years ago. About 400 million years ago, right within here, we get the first plants coming on land and the first animals coming on land. Uh, during much of this history of life on land, it has been very warm on planet Earth. Very warm. Uh, dangerously so, right here. A whole area over in what's now Siberia basically blew its top in massive volcanic eruption. Huge, about the worst thing that's ever happened in the history of, of life on Earth, and added enough carbon dioxide to the atmosphere to knock the temperature up X number of degrees. And we argue about how far it did, but it was far enough that deep that in the oceans, methane that was trapped in deep ocean sediments was released as the temperature got higher because of the carbon dioxide, and the methane that then gets released from the ocean. Is 15 times as potent as the greenhouse gas warming the place up than carbon dioxide is. Here at this point, that volcanism led to what we call in paleontology the Great Dying. 95% of every living thing on the planet was killed. So 95%. Excuse me, what year was this? What was 1946. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> right here. All right. Um, let's see that. So don't put this. This would be about 207 million years ago. It was terrible. The Earth survived just barely, and more new things then came along to replace the things that the different kinds of things that had died. But 95 percent of all the living species in the oceans and on land died. That's global warming taken to beyond it. All of this warm time, this is all warm. We, we talk now in, in geology about uh, greenhouse and ice house conditions. This is all greenhouse conditions. Very mild, very warm sometimes. Not as warm as here, but very warm. Uh, that has nothing to do with us. We've never existed. Under greenhouse conditions, we are creatures of the last million or so years, right in here. This is, we had some glaciers back here, uh, so we had a short ice house, but most of our history has been greenhouse. Lately, it's been ice house. That's the, that's the climate that we're used to. That's the climate that we and the animals around us have adapted to. Uh, anybody who says that they know what's going to happen with global warming. Uh, is telling you a story. They're projecting what they think might happen. My guess is it's probably not good. But that what it, exactly how bad it works, it probably won't won't matter. You got you got. I won't look up at it. I'm going to be long dead. And at least I say something about it, so nobody will blame me for it. But, <laughs> if there are any living politicians, by the time it gets starts to get really nasty on planet Earth. You know what they're gonna say? Well, we never thought it would be like, like that. <laughs> Just like, well, you, we thought COVID was the worst than the flu, you know. Well, don't depend on politicians to give you, and I don't care what party they belong to. Don't depend on politicians to tell you what's gonna happen when you have got the science available to tell you. Now you can not believe it. I'm not gonna argue with you. It's a waste of time. 
But think about it. Uh, what we're talking about here is what kind of a future our children and our grandchildren are going to have, and their their children and grandchildren. What's our legacy going to be? So every time you drive by Mason Esther, it's one of the few obvious things that we got here in Michigan to point to the fact that Earth has a past. It has a recent past, and it has an ever more ancient past if we look back. Some of those times have been very hard. Some of those times have been easier. But don't think that because you've never seen global warming, that it doesn't exist. That's the biggest problem that people have. If, it, if they haven't seen it in their lifetime, if it hasn't been a problem, then it won't be a problem. You know, how can we possibly have two 500 year floods? Well, we should, but because climate's changing, we sometimes have back to back, quote, 500 year floods, things that should only happen every 500 years on the average, but on the average, we change the odds of the casino. Think about it, talk to your kids about it, and they're, you know, the kids right now, they're learning about it in school and they're going to be a little bit more pushy about it, talking to their parents and their grandparents about it. And they probably won't be particularly receptive to an answer, well, it's not a real problem, we're not going to worry about it, and we'll probably figure it out when we can do. Yeah. My, change, my, change by the day. Yeah. My worry is that we won't we'll start to think seriously about doing something about it when it's too late to do something about it. Sort of, you imagine pushing a truck up a hill, but you push it a little too hard, it goes over the hill, then you better be ready to stop that truck. <laughs> <laughs> and the problem is, with the best will in the world, scientists can't figure out if you push this particular truck over the over the crest of the hill, there may be no way to, to stop it. We don't and we don't know. We have no experience. We're talking about a whole new realm for the whole human race. So it's it's serious business. It sounds like it's far away, but it's not. It's come upon us very very quickly. For what's happened in the last couple of centuries, and there's no single person. Or no single industry that's responsible for it. It's all part of it. But use that Mason Esther and any other thing, even the lakes themselves. You can look at them. You know, those are those are markers in time. Michigan has a history. The world has a history, and the world is going to have some sort of a future. Uh, what can we do to shape that future in the most productive way for our kids and our grandkids and, and every single person that will follow? I probably went too long, but that's the answer. Well, thank you. I thank Dr. Taggart for coming out tonight and telling us all of that, and uh, then ending on such a up note. <laughs> I, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I am too old to end on an up note. <laughs> It's nice to get told what it is. Uh, we have some refreshments in the back, courtesy of Keynes and uh, a few other folks who have been able to help us out. I uh, want also want to thank Capex Land Company for sponsoring the presentation this evening. They're the ones who uh, took all the gravel out of the Esker. But by and large, used them in a, in a reasonable way. That's right. Oh, what would we do if we were still on dirt roads? That's right. We got to <laughs> fix the darn roads. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to ask. Going to ask that we hold questions. To, and to Dr. Dr. Wanker, you can call her you are to, 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 Yes. All so right. we'll dismiss you and come on up if you want to, or Dr. Taggart will go back up to the lobby. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Taggart, Thank you. Thanks, Ralph. Yeah. Thank you. Well, my question: Is there any part of the Esther 